I think the story that I want to talk about is really how all of this changed over the last two years and how projects that you, you might have heard of um, have, are something different or why they got paused. So um, that's kind of the general theme of things today. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I've had this job for actually hired in February of 2020. So, so when I started the job, you know, I'd been with the city for 10 years. I felt like I knew the division knew the people, knew how the city worked. I had a fresh comprehensive plan to work off of, an economic development strategy, a housing strategy. We had a budget in place, work plans. And so, you know, we jumped on that in February of 2020. And then a month later, we threw most of that away um, when we went remote for COVID. So when that happened, our building inspection head became the head of procuring um, PP&E for, for the whole city. My head of planning department became head of emergency planning for the city of Madison temporarily. Our community development director uh, partnered up with our park superintendent and city engineer to create uh, an emergency temporary shelter for homeless men at Warner Park. So all of our plans got thrown away for those first few months. Um, and as things started to sort of settle down and we moved out of emergency planning mode and really more into a mode of trying to recover from this, uh, we just realized that all these things we've been working on, we needed to reevaluate them. So some things just got put on a back burner because they just weren't gonna happen. They were not a top priority, something changed. Other things we realized needed to happen faster than we thought because those were programs that were gonna help us get out of this. Uh, other things, the whole financial model just didn't work anymore and we had to retool them. And there are other things that we hadn't even thought of that we had to like all of a sudden react to and put on the work plan. Um, so I'm going to go through this focusing first on more of the economic development things that happened and then we'll move into more of the community development and housing uh, side of things. So I just said this, so I don't need to focus on this slide. Um, so when it comes to economic development, really a lot of our efforts over the first uh, over the last two years can fall into these four categories so small business equity and recovery in in the beginning of 2020 the, the idea was to have uh, some pilot programs to really focus our economic development resources on underrepresented communities that, that we hadn't been necessarily serving that well so um, women lgbtq um, populations of color and really help them the small businesses um, and this this started in in the beginning of 2020 as a couple hundred thousand dollar program and when COVID happened we realized this needed to become a couple of million dollars a year sort of program um streetery i think you're all familiar with what that is um we have a bunch of projects and then of course tiff so to jump into um small business equity recovery which i'm going to sometimes say sber because it's a mouthful um and i'm government so we have lots of acronyms for everything um this is, a, this is a collection of programs that, that all have a, a similar focus. So the first one was a, a grant program. Um, so when COVID happened, the initial federal um, programs, PPP, there's a bunch of, of them that went out there. Um, we heard really loudly and clearly from our small business community, especially underrepresented communities, that it either wasn't enough or some, some sectors of our, our economy we just missed out on it. So we quickly set up a program to focus on, on getting money out to usually very small businesses to help them buy um, personal protective gear and to help make up for some short-term interruptions in their cash flow so they could keep going. Um, so we had hundreds of applicants. Um, a lot of these were um, restaurants, salons, small businesses, um, and we were able to very quickly move $2 million out the door to help these businesses. This is incredibly fast for the city of Madison to move to set up a program and to disperse money directly into the hands of, of small businesses. And, and a lot of the feedback that we got was this money was the bridge that helped them get to a point where they could reopen their doors and, and get back to at least some semblance of, of normal business. Um, 
Another one which you might have heard of is our, our pop-up shop pilot program. So here the idea is to create a space um, for very early stage businesses to, to get a foothold, have inexpensive rent, um, and usually retail sort of focused. So um, Culture Collectives on State Street is our first one of this pilot. Um, so this is a partnership you know, between um, the Black Hmong Latino Chambers, the bid was involved, J.D. McCormick, who is the property owner, made this property available to us at, at a very low cost so we could set it up quickly. Um, and we've had a number of small businesses come through here, um, all owned by people of color, almost all uh, woman-owned businesses. And now we have businesses who've, who've been here for months graduating into their own full space across the city. Um, so, so the program's working um, as intended, but it's also, it, this is the first one. It's, it's a pilot. This is meant to be reproduced. It's going to be reproduced on State Street. It can be re reproduced right here downtown, um, all across the city. So this is a, a model we're looking at to help really early stage entrepreneurs get a foothold and get, get moving. Um, so commercial ownership assistance program. Um, this, this again, we, we heard from, from a lot of um, business owners, um, specifically um, small business owners, people of color who um, had successful businesses, renting property, but you know, increases in their rents were making it hard to, to keep going. They really wanted to own their businesses, uh, own the buildings that they were in um, so that they could grow, build wealth. Um, but sometimes that initial capital was was a struggle. So we created this program um, to help provide a, a soft second loan um, that's forgivable over time for these businesses. And we've had, uh, I think, four of them now where businesses that had been renting now own their buildings. Um, sometimes they're landlords for other small businesses to get started. Um, and so again, you, look, you can see the statistics, a uh, very diverse group of, of businesses that we're working on, working with, and this program continues to grow and uh, see very strong interest um, from our small business community. Um, so, so all of those programs, again, set up fast for government. <laughs> um, and they were just a, a thought we had in early 2020, and now they are, are out there doing what they were intended to do. Um, streetery. So uh, another thing that we sort of heard loud and clear in the beginning of COVID was our bar and restaurant businesses, because of public health orders, they had lowered capacity inside. And and that was a problem. And so they wanted to be able to expand their outdoor, outdoor seating. At the same time, um, traffic downtown, parking demand, dropped dramatically. So we put these two things together and we turned a lot of parking lots, city parking stalls into expanded sidewalk cafes. So we've had sidewalk cafes for, for years and years and years and years. Um, but this program let businesses that couldn't have a sidewalk cafe because of the small sidewalk they had or um, existing sidewalk cafes were could double or triple in size. Um, businesses outside of downtown could turn excess parking in their parking lot into outdoor seating. Um, and the program was hugely popular. Um, I'm sure all of you saw it over the last two years. Um, you know, King Street's a different place than it was b before COVID. And this was something that I doubt we ever would have done if, if not for the circumstances of the last two years. And now as we sort of look ahead and transition into, you know, a new sort of normal, we're not taking this away. We're, we're taking the best parts of it and trying to make it, make it permanent so that we can keep doing this, keep innovating on this idea and really taking the public spaces and, and making them more usable and not just be parking in a lot of cases. Um, I don't know if you can see that, um, but it's a graph that shows uh, the, the variety of businesses that, that, we, um, that we worked with and uh, You'll, you can see it later. It's just it's just some data. Um, so Streetery, hugely successful. Keep building on that. Um, flipping over to, to projects, uh, Judge Drill Square. So this is a project that 
uh, we've been working on since the, the day I started with the city um, 11 or, or 12 years ago. And uh, a lot of drama, which I'm sure you're all familiar with to, to get to where we are. But uh, right before COVID, uh, the city struck a deal with Stonehouse Development to build the Novo apartments over the parking structure. So that continued right into COVID and opened up, uh, you know, not that long ago and is, is uh, almost done uh, leasing up at this point. So very successful. And then right across the street, um, the, uh, the hotel piece, which you see here, um, we are ready to break ground. I think it's scheduled for a month from now. So um, what is now a, you know, a big gravel patch is gonna become a construction site again as the hotel gets going. And I have to say during COVID, nationally hotel projects across the board shut down, stopped. This project itself, we were close many times where financing became an issue, things like that, because it was just really hard to develop hotels in the middle of a pandemic. But, but this one, Mortensen came forward. Mortensen is, is gonna be there breaking ground next month. And then following soon after is the, the last phase of the project, which is the apartment piece, which will be behind the hotel. Um, and that should follow very closely behind. So this, this project is, is back on track, um, delayed. But, but back on track and uh, soon we'll also be finishing the reconstruction of Pinckney Street. So, you know, we'll be sitting here in a couple of years and we'll have an open street, a hotel, this part of, of the Capitol Square back to being a vibrant active place rather than a, a hole in the ground in a construction site. Um, Another project that that uh, that we're working on is the the Village on Park. So the Community Development Authority, which is sort of one of the hats I wear, has owned the Village on Park for for over a decade, um, and. In the middle of COVID, the board sat down and, and looked at their portfolio and directed staff to, 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 one thing we really need to do is to finish development of the Village on Park. So we started our plans for what that could be. At the same time, um, Dr. Anthony and Urban League were starting to think about creating a black owned business hub um, modeled after the Sherman Phoenix in Milwaukee, but but actually a even bigger vision than um, than the Sherman Phoenix. And the, the stars aligned that they were looking for a site to put their building and we were looking for users to help us densify um, and rebuild the village on park. And so so we partnered on this. Um, um, and the Urban League at this point is is finishing up the last couple bits of their um, project and will probably be uh, breaking ground within the next few weeks. Followed soon after, the, the CDA is gonna demolish the older parts of the Village on Park. We're gonna build a new parking structure. We will uh, we'll redo most of the site to make it uh, have better stormwater, better circulation, green spaces to make it a much more walkable urban environment. Um, so again, a couple of years from now, uh, we'll be back here showing a bunch of pretty pictures and inviting you down to the Village on Park to, to see this, this project um, come to fruition. Another project um, that I think we've probably been here multiple times talking about over the years is, is the Madison Public Market. So uh, two years ago, we were right on, you know, at the point we were getting ready to, to bid the project, finish its financing, COVID happened and we hit pause on this project. Um, and that's partially because uh, the idea of opening a public market in the middle of a pandemic, we didn't know what that market was going to look like. Um, the, the financing model, all, all of that needed, needed to be looked at again. So we had pause on this project, but we didn't stop looking at it. We didn't stop actually working on it. Um, so over the last two years, um, the site itself has been used for our temporary men's shelter after we moved out of Warner Park. So the building is, is being used. Um, but this project is now uh, back on track and we are finishing up the last few pieces of its financing and it 
I feel very confident that, um, you know, even later this year, we'll be beginning construction on the public market. So again, this project, it, it you know, got paused, it got retooled, but it is back on track to be moving ahead um, shortly. The, the Lake Street ramp. So uh, the Lake Street ramp at the end of its useful life right downtown, um, hundreds and hundreds of parking stalls um, used for all sorts of uh, State Street you know, visitors, used for sporting events, used by UW. Um, and when we, again, sat down two years ago, uh, parking utility was flush with, with cash, had strong reserves. In COVID, not the case. Our, our parking occupancy is dramatically down. The parking utility has been using reserves to keep, keep going. So we sat down and said, how are we gonna rebuild this ramp if the parking utility doesn't have those reserves? So or what we did instead is we issued a request for proposal to find a, a private sector partner on this. So the idea here is that we're gonna, we ran a request for a proposal, had strong response from the development community, um, and we're very close to moving ahead to selecting a partner and moving ahead with them. So this parking ramp will get demolished. Um, a new public ramp will be built, and then above it will be hundreds of units of, of student housing, retail, and why that's important is that we get to sell those air rights to help pay for our parking ramp, but we'll also create a new TIF district, a tax and rental financing district, so we can capture those new property taxes from the private development up above to help pay for the parking ramp that sits below it. So um, this is a big project. It's not unlike Judge Doyle Square in this case, where it's a public-private partnership with a lot of moving pieces. Hopefully this will not take us 12 years to figure it out and get under construction. Um, but I, I feel pretty confident that we'll, we'll know who the partner is and be able to get moving on this um, later this year. Um, that sort of leads into the next piece, which is which is TIF. So um, State Street uh, has had TIF districts in the past, um, and we are looking to create a new one. Um, we'll start the paperwork later this year to create a new TIF district that runs up and down State Street, and it's going to capture the new development at the Lake Street parking ramp. It'll capture the, the development at the new core uh, apartment building in the, in the middle of State Street. And what that's gonna let us do is pay for that parking ramp, but also help us pay for just general improvements up and down State Street, but it can also help to pay for some of that programming I talked about in the beginning. So pop-up shops, commercial ownership, some tenant improvement programs. There's, there's a long list of things that, that we could do with this TIF district to help um, to help the small businesses on State Street. Um, so that process is just getting kicked off now, um, but but it's it's in our budget. It, it's going to happen. There will be a new State Street TIF district. The other downtown. Uh, downtown-ish uh, TIF district that was created is the Regent Street TIF district. So this goes from uh, from sort of region in West Washington um, most of the way down Regent Street. And this is a great timing because we're seeing a lot of development interests um, up and down Regent Street. So um, you can see here new student housing, um, uh, Bayview is, while it's an affordable housing development, it will also generate new property taxes. And the idea here with this Region Street TIF district is that we can capture some of this new development that's happening, um, but we can also help rebuild a lot of that infrastructure that sits in there. So uh, Region Street, not the most pedestrian friendly place. A lot of those street crossings are, are not the safest in the city. And just here at Bayview alone, we have hundreds of children who daily cross the street to go to the park. Um, so, so this new district will help us pay for infrastructure improvements to do all, to, to do all that. But it'll also help us pay for um, more affordable housing, which I'll get to later, that, that exists right here in the district. 
So we have these new districts, we're just starting them. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how we use TIF. So I think, you know, when, when you hear about it in the newspaper, probably when people from the city come and, and talk about TIF, we're talking about TIF where we, we give TIF to a developer to help them do their project, to help fill a financial gap. That's, that's only a small part of how we actually use the TIF program. And one of the things that's changed over the last couple of years is really thinking about the part of TIF that's not about developers. So when we create a, a TIF district, um, there's, there's a bunch of projects that happen in there. And what we've really gotten a lot better at doing is being able to say, all right, we know that in this specific geography, there's going to be a new apartment building here. There's going to be an office building there. And if they go as we expect, this TIF district five years from now is going to have a lot of new development in it. And it's going to make it's going to be bringing a lot of new taxes in. So we started to create financial models to project ahead. What what happens if this building gets built? What if maybe values go up or down? So we can now do a better job at predicting where this what this what this TIF district will be able to do. And at the same time, uh, on the other side of, of the ledger, we can look and say, well, what costs do we have? What infrastructure things do we have in, lined up in the next five or six years? So what that lets us do is say, all right, we're going to have to spend X million in this area four years from now. But we know because of this development happening, TIF can pay for half of that. And we can start to line those things up to be much more strategic about how we do our infrastructure projects. And, and the most visible example of this is bus rapid transit. So bus rapid transit is the kind of project that it takes a decade to plan. And you have to lay out your financials to apply to, to the federal government way in advance. So we knew that in, in 2023, 2024, the city of Madison have to come up with something like $50 million to pay for our piece of bus rapid transit. So what we did is we looked at our TIF districts and said, okay, TIF districts that are along these bus rapid transit routes, what can you do? What, where will you be financially in 2023? And when we looked at that, we said, the research park is having a lot of development. Exact Sciences, uh, Rayovac building, their new headquarters, other developments happening there were coming online just at the right time so that that TIF district can pay the city of Madison's entire share, well, almost entire share of bus rapid transit. Um, and that's something we just couldn't do before because we just didn't have the tools to sort of forecast ahead. Um, but that's just a way that we're being more and more strategic in a, in a way that it doesn't end up in, in the newspaper. It's a nerdy budget thing, um, but it, it lets us use TIF in a way we never could before. Um, and that sort of leads into the next piece, which is um, TID donation, which again is a kind of a nerdy thing. But when we create a district, it's a very specific geography where the, the taxes generated in there usually get reinvested in that place. But what we can do is if we create a TIF district on one side of town and it's doing really great, lots of development happening, and we create a TIF district on the other side of town and maybe it's a little bit slower, maybe it has a lot more costs because we have a lot of infrastructure, we can move money from one district to another to let them, again, do things that they couldn't do before. And where you see this is the, is the Village on Park. So with the Village on Park, the, the city of Madison has, has pretty significant infrastructure costs to bring the stormwater up to, up to speed, to make a bunch of these infrastructure connections, to put in the parking. Um, and the TIF district itself, it can't really pay for all of that. But other districts across the city that are doing better than we thought, we can move money across the city into that so that a TIF district can do things that it just otherwise wouldn't be able to do financially. And then the last thing that, again, you're seeing with TIFF, or, or really probably not seeing, but is happening in the background, is that we identified in state law, 
when you create a TIF district, it lasts for a certain number of years. But there's a provision that says when you're almost at the end of that life of a TIF district, you can take that money and use it for affordable housing. And more importantly, you can use it for affordable housing anywhere in the city, not just in your TIF district. So what we do is we have a TIF district like downtown, TID 25, which covers, uh, you know, covered a good chunk of the square. Um, when it closes, it's going to give off millions of dollars and we take that money and we push it into affordable housing across the city and so tiff ends up being the main way that we are paying for a lot of our affordable housing in the city but it's not tiff going directly to a developer it's it's happening in a way that exists in the budget um, so this is probably the, one of the more boring parts of my presentation. It's not a very attractive slide, but I just want to sort of make the point that TIF is doing a lot of things for us that, that you, you just don't always see. Um, and that sort of is my transition from the economic development side of things over to the community development side, over to the housing side of things. So I apologize. Some of this is a little more text heavy policies don't lend themselves to like pretty pictures and good slides so um I'll, I'll do my best so again when we when i started this job in in 2020 we looked at what we were doing in housing and we had a, a lot of programs we we're very involved with um, the affordable housing market so on the homelessness side the, the county pays for a lot of the shelters but the city pays for a lot of the housing programs to help people get out of homelessness so per in support of housing. Um, rapid rehousing is a program where you get someone out of shelter and into stable housing for a, a bit of time before they move on to the general market. And then there's a lot of homeless services that the city pays for. So millions of dollars going to that. On the rental side, we're pushing about $10 million into the creation of new rental housing every year. Um, and that affordable housing fund, that's the one that's paid for by TIF, um, or at least partially by TIF. Um, so we're creating units every year. And then through the CDA, we're also um, you know, landlord for 1,000 households, and we help pay the rent for another 1,800 households. So we're very involved with the rental market. Um, and then on the ownership side, we spend about $5 million dollars a year, um, mostly helping get people, first-time home buyers, in, into housing. So these programs, they were working well. But again, when COVID happened, we took time to sit down and really evaluate what we're doing. Which of these programs was really working well? What needed some, some extra tweaking? And you know, what weren't we doing? Um, so we sat down and looked at all the, the great housing reports that have been written over the last 10 years. I'm biased because I wrote a number of them. Um, but it's about 1,700 pages of data and about 100 recommendations exist in all these housing reports. So what we did is we sat down and we started to sort through them and say, well, what are the most what are the most uh, feasible, what are the most impactful recommendations that are in here? Um, and then we worked with our city's housing strategy committee to really sort of refine those and, and get them down to a strategy that we call housing forward. So housing forward is really a series of five main policy areas um, that we were gonna drill in on. So increasing housing choice. So this is really, just recognizing the fact that the city of Madison for the last 15 years has been growing at a faster rate than we had for the previous 50. And what that means is that we have very strong demand for housing in our market. At the same time, we just haven't been able to keep up on the construction side of things. So, you know, since 2010, we've hovered at around 3% vacancy in our rental market. Not the 5% that economists would say is healthy, which that's our target is 5%. But despite everything that, that gets built, we, we never get much above a 3% vacancy rate. We're constantly chasing that. And that means that we need to find ways to create more housing. And it's really also recognizing it's more of every kind of housing and it's really at every price point and in every part of the city so so this is a toolkit to look at how do we just create supply to help keep up with demand 
In this next bucket about creating affordable housing throughout the city, recognizing it just recognizes that supply alone isn't going to be this isn't going to solve the problem of how do we house our, our lowest income people in the city, and again. There's a geography component of this is that we want to make sure that if, if you are a lower income person, you have a housing option everywhere in the city, not just on the edges of the city, not just in concentrations of poverty. So strategies around that. Combating displacement segregation is these are these are geographic things. It's it's making sure that places have opportunities for people, um, ensuring that seniors and others can stay in their housing. This is housing stability. So if we do all this work to get someone into housing, we want to make sure they can stay there and they're going to be successful in it. And if they've been in housing for a long time, that they're not priced out of it. Um, and then work to end homelessness is pretty self-explanatory. So I'll walk through a bit of, of what each of these things, what we're doing. So, so increased housing choice, the, the rules of building housing. There's a lot of zoning technical changes. And you probably saw throughout 2021, a number of these things uh, were loosened. So we allowed more things to be built without having to go to the plan commission. Um, we created some new higher density zoning districts so that other places can look a bit more like downtown because now there's a zoning designation to allow it. Um, so these all, these all pass. Some of them were very long council meetings to get through um, sort of loosening up zoning. Um, and we're just starting to see some of these come to fruition um, where, where people are taking advantage of this new slightly more relaxed um, set of set of zoning rules. Uh, Nathan's laughing at this. <laughs> um, so, so that's 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 the goal there, but that's not an, that's not enough. So on the affordable housing side, um, we decided that we needed to take that uh, that affordable housing fund. We needed to grow it, but we also needed to make sure it was really focused on on delivering the kind of affordable housing that we said we wanted, which is. Um, on transit, so focusing really on those places that have the best transit access, making sure that those buildings served not just low and moderate income households, but often our most vulnerable also had a place in those developments, and that we tried to stretch the how long they would be affordable. So a lot of these programs say you need to be affordable for 30 years, but we said 30 is probably not enough. We need to go 40, we need to go 50 years um, if we're going to make investments in these buildings. We also said, well, that's great, but we should also create a land banking fund so the city itself can, can go take advantage of a property that's for sale and we could hold it and give time for an affordable housing developer to put something together to develop affordable housing on a site that they otherwise might not be able to get a hold of because it's maybe it's so attractive or it's a rapidly gentrifying area of the city and we need to get in front of that by, by buying some land. Um, we also said, well, you know, if the city is going to fund you to build affordable housing, we should probably make it easier for you to demolish the gas station that's there already or whatever building is there. So it's simplifying the rules when it comes to affordable housing development. And then we also realized that we live in the, the state of Wisconsin, which has uh, a lot of rules about what a city can do when it comes to um, supporting affordable housing, not financially, but through rulemaking. So the city of Madison partnered with UW um, uh, and with a number of our nonprofits and this nonprofit Change Lab in San Francisco to really look at Wisconsin state laws and see what levers we could pull to make it easier and more attractive to develop affordable housing in the city of Madison. And so that work is just getting started. Um, I don't know if you can see that at all, but that's a city, that's a, that's a map of the city of Madison. And these, these are examples of the affordable housing developments that we've built um, in the last, call it 10 years or so, probably seven years. So you can see they're sort of scattered all over the city um, with plenty downtown and on the isthmus. Um, and you know the result of these investments has been the creation of about 1,500 new affordable housing units. And I'll be the first person to admit that 1,500 new affordable housing units is not enough to deal with our shortage of these units. But to put it into perspective, 
before we started all of this, we were producing a dozen new affordable housing units a year. Now we produce hundreds of new affordable housing units per year. To build the public housing that we own, the 900 units, that took us 25 years, and we did this in eight. So this this rate of new production is is really incredible compared to where we were. But we need to keep pushing on this and need to keep doing more. Um, so you know, combating displacement segregation. Um, we just realized not, not every development is going to be a hundred unit tax credit building um, on a major roadway. There's a lot of other types of housing. There's a lot of nonprofits doing really great work. So we created a new funding source just for the smaller projects that are going to fit into a neighborhood to make sure that every neighborhood can have some uh, affordable housing in it. And then we created that fund and then we doubled it in size this year. Um, and we're also creating newer programs that can help with small scale development. So I talked in the previous slide about how we made the rules easier to build small scale missing middle type by housing. When you take a rule change to make it easier to build it, and then we layer in a funding source to do it, that's I think where we really see the change happen is when, when the rules, the funding, the programs all align to do things that any one of those changes probably couldn't do on their own. Um, and then we're also working to really focus in on how do we create homeownership opportunities for uh, people of color in our community. So um, this is just an initial goal of 125. I think we'll probably, you know, if so to me, we, we double that, that goal. Um, and then when it comes to letting people stay in their homes, uh, we created a new partnership between the Office of Civil Rights and our building inspection unit so that if a, a renter makes a complaint, a complaint against a landlord to, to make sure that they're not retaliated against. Um, and so building inspection and civil rights make sure that we have tools to stop a landlord from retaliating against a tenant for you know, reporting a building inspection violation in their building. Um, the big money in this area has been that we received $22 million of federal rental assistance funds, which we pushed out that money over the last two years to make sure that if someone had their income drop or something happened related to COVID, that they could keep on paying their rent. Um, again, $22 million in a new program over two years. It's not something that the city is set up to do. So we, we had to create partnerships. We work with the county, we work with nonprofits. Um, and it wasn't always smooth, but we were able to do this and prevent thousands of people from, from missing rent payments and being evicted. Um, these are a bunch of other funding programs, eviction defense funds, rehabilitation and property tax assistance for seniors who could no, who owned their home but could no longer afford to pay their property tax bill. We've got programs to help people with that. Um, and then we also have a bunch of new programs that, that again, if, if you're a low income homeowner to help save you money on your water, electricity bills, these sorts of things, so you can stay in your home and stay stable there. Um, when it comes to ending homelessness, um, one of the things that, again, sort of probably flies under the radar is when we create new affordable housing tax credit buildings, we make sure that those, those buildings have a, a segment of those units in there carved out for really our lowest income, most vulnerable people. So these affordable housing developments have a wide variety of incomes, but we try to make sure there's always some set aside, um, oftentimes for people coming out of our shelter system. So they move into housing in a mixed income building with services attached to it at a rent that they can afford. Um, um, so this doesn't create a lot at a time, but it creates a steady stream of those new housing units. Um, we also can't keep operating our men's shelter in temporary locations. We move from Warner Park to First Street, and we're not moving back to church basements. That's not a possibility. So that means that we need to build a purpose-built men's homeless shelter. Um, and that's not easy. And it's fairly expensive, um, but the city, working with the county, working with the federal government, we've put together so far about $11 million for this development. And I think in the next couple of weeks, you'll be hearing from the city 
what that plan actually is, where it's going to go, what's the timeline, all of those things. Um, we're getting very close to wrapping up our due diligence on a site. Um, so that's, that's the men. Um, for women and families, shelter services are provided by a, a number of organizations, but our primary shelter is the Salvation Army site on East Washington Avenue. And again, they were teed up, ready to start moving right before COVID. And we had to pivot. We set up a, a new temporary shelter um, in, uh, on the east side. We moved people into hotels. This project got delayed, but now we're working to get it back on track. Um, and one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to buy some excess land from the Salvation Army to help kickstart their, their capital campaign to rebuild this shelter um, on, on their East Washington campus. Um, we also worked to create new opportunities for, for tiny houses, for uh, mission camps, for portal mission camps, to create alternatives to a traditional apartment building and alternative to a congregate shelter for people who who weren't ready or weren't who weren't willing or a good fit for either of those things. Um, and then we actually went and built one of these. So we built a temporary structured campground as an alternative to shelter at Dairy Drive. Um, so that second D should be capitalized. I'll correct that later in my slides. Um, so these are prefab buildings that went up at the end of last year on the Southeast side. And we were able to move people out of Rindall Park into this, it has, these are heated, cooled, they have electricity. There's on-site service providers to provide an alternative to shelter, an alternative to camping, um, which again, this was not on anyone's radar before COVID. This happened faster than city projects normally do, um, but it, but it's been it's been pretty successful, and we have had people move out of here to move into permanent housing um, as a result of being connected to services at the site. Um, and we look ahead at what's on the, the work plan for, for 2022. Um, on the homelessness side, we've got the funding pieces together. We should go build shelter. And that's a lot of work with our community partners to say, what do those spaces have to be? Um, what does that building need to look like? How's it going to function best for the service provider? How's it going to function best for the people who are going to be sleeping there at night? Um, so that's, that's a lot of work that we have ahead of us. Um, on the zoning side, now that we know where bus rapid transit is going to go, now that we have a pretty good sense of how our bus system is going to look in the future, one of the things that we want to do is to create some new zoning tools so that if you are close, um, if you're a, a construction site that's close to bus rapid transit, that we have a, a slightly different set of rules for you. Maybe you can build an extra story. Maybe you can get away with less parking in your building. A variety of things to make make for denser development along those transit corridors. Um, so that should be coming pretty soon. Um, and then on the affordable housing side, keep working to make it so that if, if you're building affordable housing and we're funding it, that you have a faster, easier path to get that development done. Um, we have more funding coming from this Housing Forward application. Um, and then another one of the really big ones is, like I said, we own about a thousand units of affordable housing uh, and it's public housing. This is developed in the 60s and the 70s and a number of them are, are ready for redevelopment. So the, the big one here is that's close to downtown is the redevelopment of the Triangle site. So bounded by West Washington, Regent Park Street. Um, Bayview, as I talked about before, is already underway. They're already a construction site on their side. The CDA needs to do its part. Um, and I think this project more than anything kind of wraps together everything I've talked about today. So this is a very, prominent site. It's a gateway to downtown. It's on transit in every direction. We've created that new Regent Street TIF district to help pay for a lot of the improvements here. We have the affordable housing fund to help pay for it. This is not the CDA doing it on its own. We've put together a, a team of development partners um, that is local, is diverse, is headed up by New Year um, developments. And we're just kicking this off now to have a public engagement um, 
piece, then we will be redeveloping all you know, 400 of our units into a new dense mixed use development that is sustainable. Um, and like I said, is you know a new gateway into downtown. So I think it's very exciting. And again, hopefully I'll be back in a year or so to show you a bunch of pretty pictures about what that's going to look like. Um, so that's what I have for today. I am more than happy to take questions. I think I'm supposed to show this slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. What a great presentation. That's like maybe coming cold off the bench for a COVID <laughs> speech. You did pretty well to break down so much information for us in an hour. So wonderful. Any questions in the audience for Matt today? Do you want to raise your hand? Oh, uh, wait until the mic comes to you, yeah, right? Is probably time for one. Unfortunately. We have time for yeah, one so, question. I don't know. I think you had your hand up first. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, John. Oh, thanks, Matt. That is absolutely terrific. There's so much good information in there. Um, in terms of the uh, affordable housing, and I know I've seen graphs that show um, the, the gap between um, incomes and cost of housing, you know, in this community, there's a pretty big gap, and that's something that needs to be um, decreased, as you know. Um, are you guys, with your efforts, like, do you have benchmarks like wanting to have to, to be able to narrow that gap that by like 2024, we'll have this many more affordable housing units, 2026, 20, you know, are you doing that at all? Almost like a thermometer kind of thing you see that how are we doing with our efforts? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'll say like our market rate developers are really, really good at delivering housing that works for the typical Madison and renter, the median renter, right? So it's it's really, we're talking about our households that make, you know, like 60% of our median income or less is really where we focus our efforts. And when you look at the data, uh, the first thing I say is students mess it all up because they make zero dollars and they pay a lot of rent. So you kind of have to, th I'm going to push all the students aside for a second and just look at a really sort of our, our uh, adult over 25 households, right, who, who fall in that category. And you're right, it's, it's probably 7,000 households fall in that category, and they pay more than half of their income to rent. Um, and we don't have strong enough tools to deliver on those 7,000 households today and meet the growing demand. You know, we're adding hundreds per year. And the, and the gap is thousands. So I don't want to stand up here and say that, that this is going to solve all of those problems, but we are chipping away at it. Um, it's probably a disappointing answer to say that I don't really have. <laughs> yep. Wonderful. Well, um, I think Matt's going to stick around for a couple of minutes. So if anybody in the audience has questions that you want to come up and ask Matt after uh, we wrap up today, you're welcome to do so. Um, so thank you again, Matt, for taking the time to join us and for your continued partnership with DMI. We really, truly appreciate it. Um, as always, if there's anything that DMI or the people in this room can do for you, please let us know. We're happy to do so. With that, we'd like to close today's program by thanking again our sponsors, Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison, Michael Best and Friedrich, State Bank of Cross Plains, Ryan Harper and Van Duren, the Edgewater Hotel, and UW Health, Unity Point Health, Meritor, and Courts. We appreciate everybody in the room for attending. I'm not sure if we had people online, but if we did, we appreciate you all for attending. And uh, have a wonderful, safe day. And we'll see you hopefully next month when it's a little bit warmer. And um, I, I don't think we have our topic up for next month here, but we'll let you all know. So watch your emails. Thank you very much. Thanks again. I appreciate it.